everybody. Again, for those of you who are just joining now, my name is Gary Painter. Um, I'm a professor in the Price School of Public Policy. I also have the privilege of directing the Price Center for Social Innovation and the Homelessness Policy Research Institute. Uh, today, we're very happy to have Jason Ward presenting research of his and his colleagues on the effects of project labor agreements on the production of affordable housing evidence from Proposition Triple H, as is commonly known. Uh, this, this, this conversation, this seminar is also jointly sponsored by the Lusk Center for Real Estate here at USC and our Urban Growth Seminar. Um, so because we only have an hour, um, I, I wanted just to share kind of our parameters. Um, we're going to generally give Jason the first half hour or so to, to present his work. Um, he is gracious enough to welcome any clarifying questions that you might have. You can either put them in the chat and I can facilitate, or you can use the raise hand feature and I will call on you when there's an appropriate time. But we, we do plan to have about 25 minutes for questions and answers at the end also. Um, again, if you have any clarifying questions, feel free to jump in as Jason is going through his kind of pr presentation of the question and the results. So without further ado, Jason, and thank you for joining us today to share this research with our community. Thanks a lot for the opportunity to present to you all. I'm really excited to um, show you what I've been up to for some months of my life. Um, this has been a project that's basically been just me, though I've certainly benefited from the, some excellent peer review and uh, some suggestions and insights from a lot of people, some of whom were, uh, you know, chose to remain anonymous due to sort of the sensitive nature of this topic. And that's totally understandable, but um, I've tried to be uh, as transparent as I can in this research and, um, and you know, do my best to shed some light on this um, pretty contentious issue. So let me jump right in. Um, yeah, so just to give a little background on myself, I'm a, an associate economist at RAND in Santa Monica. Um, I uh, co-direct with a colleague, Sarah Hunter here at RAND, the Center on Housing and Homelessness in Los Angeles, which is a recently founded uh, initiative that was uh, made possible through the, a gift from one of our trustees uh, with a mandate to focus on sort of uh, policy relevant research around these two major issues in our lives here in the region. Um, so let me just jump right in. Uh, I'm going to start by just giving a really brief background on Proposition HHH in case it is helpful for anyone. Um, this was a $1.2 billion bond offering that was approved uh, as a ballot initiative by LA voters in 2016 in order to spur the development of up to 10,000 units of uh, housing aimed at people experiencing homelessness in Los Angeles. Um, five years later, or at the present time, um, as many of you probably already know, uh, a few of these units are actually online. The costs have been dramatically higher than was pitched during the initiative's uh, campaign. And uh, HHH has faced a criticism from a number of corners, including a relatively high profile report from the city controller uh, multiple council members uh, making uh, sort of introducing motions related to clawing back some of this money, uh, some criticism from Judge Carter as it relates to uh, resource use and the issues on Skid Row and others. Um, however, despite all this attention, there's relatively little evidence on why the costs for HHH funded projects have been so much higher than were projected. Uh, one notable difference, however, between HHH and other funding sources that are used in projects in the city supportive housing pipeline is the project labor agreement that is unique to HHH. Um, so for those who aren't uh, particularly uh, familiar with project labor agreements, the, I'm just going to give a few key kind of uh, points about them. PLAs, and I'm speaking in this case of PLAs that are sort of in the public works dimension. There are also uh, PLAs governing private construction projects that may differ somewhat, but, um, but generally public works PLAs are a pre-bid contract between a relevant funding authority and area trade unions. Key features of these agreements uh, are that they require virtually all hiring to be done through union halls with a small number of uh, non-union workers, often called core workers that are, th this is usually a key negotiating point as to how many of these there can be, but it's often as small as say half a dozen or something. Th these workers must usually be matched one-to-one -one with union workers. 
The agreement specifies the ratios of apprentices to journey level workers. It has enforceable arbitration and grievance procedures. It uh, stipulates no lockouts or strikes during the term of the agreement. And it has a number of other rules around work hours, pay and benefits. Participation in a PLA is mandatory for any contractor, whether union or not, desiring to work on an associated project. Um, most public PLAs also now include targeted hiring provisions, which are um, generally specifying sort of goals for the utilization or hiring of local and disadvantaged workers for characteristics that may uh, include, say, zip code of residence or certain qualifying conditions such as being a veteran, having experienced homelessness, being a custodial single parent, uh, things like this. Uh, though it's notable that these are distinct from the enforceable provisions above and in all instances I'm aware of, they simply reply, they rely on what's called good faith efforts from the relevant unions to meet them. Um, oops. So I'll give you a little bit of background now on the HHH PLA in particular, since um, it's, it's what's driving this study. Uh, this PLA was added to Proposition HHH by the LA City Council in 2018, about a year and a half after the initial, uh, uh, the initial election in which it was passed. Um, the motivation given by the city council was to reinvest bond dollars into our local neighborhoods and residents by training and employing them as often as possible on funded projects while maintaining the unit goal of Proposition HHH. Um, and that statement is kind of what has motivated the, the form of this research, and I'll sort of touch on that a few different times. Um, and then it's, what's important to discuss here is, is how this PLA is, is, uh, differs in, in an important way from typical PLAs. So as a sort of a, a more canonical example of a public works PLA, the Los Angeles Unified School District has a PLA governing uh, capital projects for the district. And, and this is more of a typical situation where say if LAUSD wants to build a school, they would cite the location of the school, they would design the school, they would have everything sort of set up and then they would go to builders and put it out to bid and say, if you wanna build this, you know, give us your bid, you have to be a signatory to this PLA. Um, the HHH PLA is quite unique and different from that sort of a scenario and that it doesn't apply to a project that's been proposed, cited, et cetera. It, it applies to any project that seeks to use HHH as a funding source and, and notably as one funding source among many since HHH typically only funds about maybe a quarter of a project's costs. So basically any project that wants to use this partial funding source has to be a signatory to the PLA if the proposed project comprises 65 or more housing units. And this uh, sort of clear and very formal threshold for the application of the PLA is what is, allows the PLA attached to HHH to, to shape the portfolio of proposed projects. Having said that, th this is gonna kind of be the research questions I'm gonna try to provide some evidence on. First, did the PLA affect the unit goal of Proposition HHH? And if it did, by how much did it? Uh, and, and I'm gonna focus in answering this question, I'm gonna focus on two mechanisms, the developer response to the PLA and the PLA's effect on costs. And then I'm gonna show you some evidence that tries to bring these two mechanisms together into sort of a, a broader estimate of what happened with the PLA. The second thing that I'm really just gonna to touch on, but uh, I think it's important though, there's not great evidence on it. And I'll just try to characterize that evidence is how well do PLAs do in meeting targeted hiring goals? And how do these, uh, does this you know, mechanism for increasing the hiring of desired groups uh, compare to the status quo? Um, so I'm gonna briefly touch on the existing research on PLAs. I don't really have the time to go into it in depth, but I just wanted to point out a couple of key characteristics. Um, the first is that most of the research I was able to find on the cost and competitiveness, competitiveness effects of PLAs on projects uh, is characterized by pretty poor research designs, um, mostly related to poor comparability between PLA and non-PLA projects or between projects over time. Um, and both of these factors can confound the PLA effect with that of other cost drivers. Um, and to give a little bit more intuition there, a lot of, so a typical study um, that might be carried out would say, take all school construction projects in the state of Massachusetts over a period of 
20 years or something, right? And so there's two issues here. One is that you may find that, for instance, and this is, all, this is the case in a number of studies and they, they've been sort of rightfully critiqued, that you may find that like in that kind of an example I just gave, all PLA projects were in Boston. So if you run a regression model where you, you regress the costs of a project on an indicator for a PLA being in effect, what you're often doing is simply looking at the effect of building a school in Boston. And that may be subject to a lot of cost drivers that aren't related directly to a PLA. And then the second thing, as I mentioned, is that sometimes these uh, data sets span a decade or even two decades where a lot of things may have changed about building technology, labor supply, many other drivers of cost. Um, so this has um, led to what I, what I would characterize as a pretty, a pretty uh, sort of criticizable body of existing research. The second factor that struck me that I was not really, uh, I had not really encountered before in the research that I've conducted uh, prior to this is that the PLA research, along with like the issues like prevailing wage, is just a remarkably partisan literature in terms of uh, almost all this research having an explicit affiliation with organizations that have a strong policy position on PLAs or whatever, you know, pre prevailing wage, et cetera. In other words, you know, the research that finds that PLAs have big costs are generally conducted by developer concerns or think tanks funded by developers or heavy free market leanings, et cetera. While, you know, research that finds that PLAs don't have any cost difference with non-PLA projects are all tend to all be funded by some group that, you know, is advocate for PLAs or has strong ties to union labor, et cetera. So um, th this makes, you know, it just makes making sense of the existing literature more difficult in my opinion. Um, I was only able to find two studies that were conducted by sort of ostensibly nonpartisan organizations that were both governmental agencies. One was the New Jersey Department of Labor and one was the General Accounting Office. Both of these studies, um, which were generally more descriptive in nature, found that PLAs were study associated with a cost increase of around 20%, which is sort of on the low to middle range of the cost effects found among the organizations that have more of a anti-PLA position ex ante. Um, so that is um, all just to sort of set up how I hope that this study um, makes a contribution and differs from the past work. Um, and <clears throat> aside from the nonpartisan affiliation uh, of RAND and, uh, you know, my own, uh, take it with a grain of salt, but my own sort of lack of a strong position about this uh, as a policy, um, the setting that I'm going to study here improves in a couple of important ways on past research. Um, first, uh, what I'm doing here is essentially using as data a large number of supportive housing projects that were proposed and built in the city of LA, where some of these projects were funded through HHH and some were not. So basically they're all the same type of housing project and they're all built in a city with a, a, a lot of common factors, regulations, di different sorts of barriers over time, cost drivers, et cetera. Um, also, all the projects in the cost analysis component of this pro this research use LIHTC funding, so they're all subject to another a significant uh, framework of other regulatory issues related to this very common funding source as well. Um, in terms of the, the sort of temporal issue I mentioned, all these projects were undertaken in a really compressed time period relative to most past research. Uh, they all applied for LIHTC funding between mid-2015 and early 2021, so just a little over five years. Um, and then just a general word on the data. Uh, the data in this project come from multiple sources, including uh, LA, HCID, uh, the, the joint committee that issues LIHTC funding in California, TCAC, SIDLAC, uh, the LA Department of City Planning, the California Department of Industrial Relations, County Assessor, and then media reports and other sort of online outlets to fill in data gaps. And uh, one of the reasons I mentioned this is that um, all the data and code for this study have been made publicly available. They're all in a GitHub repository that fully replicates uh, all the analyses here. And, um, you know, part of the reason to do that is to invite just just to try to provide a, a sort of a richer data source to people who might be interested in carrying on other research. And uh, just to be quite transparent about what I'm doing in this project. Um, so I'm going to start by presenting some sort of descriptive evidence uh, on the developer response to the PLA. So this is descriptive in that it's not based on a sort of a 
uh, regression-based research design or anything like that, but I think nonetheless it has a strong um, claim to causality, and I'm going to see, you can see if you agree with me here. Um, and I just thought anecdotally it was uh, worth noting that th these results are what drew me into conducting this research. Um, and, and how this came about was that as part of our uh, activities in starting up the center that I'm co-directing, uh, we met over a period of months with a variety of policymakers and stakeholders in the housing and homelessness space in Los Angeles. And one of these meetings was with a nonprofit affordable housing developer who in the course of a pretty far ranging conversation mentioned the HHH PLA and professed uh, to be, you know, just not really have any understanding over what it would be like to have a project be subject to it. But this individual was uh, considering moving forward on a project that would be subject to it. And so, you know, basically we had a conversation where I said, well, what's that going to be like? And, there, and this, uh, this individual said, I don't know. And, that, and then when, uh, in the course of this, when the 65 unit threshold for, how, for what triggers the use of the PLA was mentioned, as someone who does policy evaluation as my sort of living, that, that really set off some alarm bells for me because that sounded like the kind of thing that could have some very strong incentives uh, sort of implicitly attached to it. And sort of, you know, it, virtually literally what I did is got off that call, downloaded the data from the city on HHH project sizes, and I developed the, fo the following figure, which is what kind of drew me into this project. Um, so this figure is a histogram that shows the distribution of HHH funded projects according to their size and housing units. Housing units per project are on the x-axis here. These are in five unit groups. So for instance, 50 is 50 to 54 units. On the y-axis is the number of projects. And as you can see here, as you, um, so taller bars represent more projects. Uh, and it, you can see as you sort of move into larger and larger projects here from quite small projects, you see a, a rapid growth in the amount of projects being proposed at different sizes. Th this relates at least in part uh, to some financial incentives included in HHH that provide uh, lower interest rates for larger projects and also likely to the fact that HHH, uh, the committee that it allocated funding prioritized size to some extent. So there's some selection here uh, on a couple of dimensions. But you see this sort of working to, to lead to larger and larger projects, leading up to this extraordinarily large uh, amount of projects, which is immediately to the left of the threshold for the PLA. So this tall bar here is, is projects with between 60 and 64 units. And in, in these data, there are around 23 of them out of about 100 odd HHH projects in the data in total. And then you can see, and, and notably about, uh, if, I, if I remember right, I think maybe 11 of these projects or almost, almost half of them are literally 64 units. And then as you cross this threshold, you can see basically there's one project with 65 to 69 units. And in fact, this entire group of projects between 65 and around 104 units is roughly equivalent to the number of projects that have exactly 60 to 64 units. So when I saw this result, I was, you know, quite struck by it and, and thought, okay, there's very likely something really significant going on with respect to this PLA threshold. Um, hey Jason, there was a question about um, the project count for HHH and the incentives or constraints to project unit count inherent with LIHTC anyway. I don't know if you have anything to say about that. Okay, great. So I think, I think I'm about to provide some evidence on that. Um, so I think, you know, that was my next question essentially is, you know, that there may be some issue here where this discontinuity may correspond with other factors, right? It may, it may sure. represent a natural sort of change in construction type that disincentivizes projects on the other side of this threshold. It may have to do with LIHTC or other common funding sources, et cetera, right? So the net, that this is where I um, thought what I can do is bring to bear the other projects in the city's uh, full project or pipeline of uh, supportive housing projects. And I think to answer the sample size question that you alluded to, Gary, there are about 100 HHH projects. And then the city also sort of tracks around 34 other projects in, in, in its total pipeline of managed uh, of, of supportive housing. So what I'm gonna do next is compare this distribution of HHH projects to a distribution of non-HHH projects that as far as I'm aware, are, are uh, you know, more or less identical conceptually in every other way and that they're supportive housing projects. They use other similar funding sources. They use LIHTC, they're all built in LA, they're built over the same time period, et cetera. 
So now instead of looking at the number of units on the y-axis, I'm going to look at the share of total projects in percent terms so that each of these groups of different colored bars sum to 100%. Because there are fewer non-HHH projects, I, I make these bins larger. I still split at the HHH threat at the PLA threshold, and then I just go out by 15 units until I get to sort of these absorbing states of like significantly smaller or larger projects. And what you can see here um, is a few things I think are worth noting. First, as you can see, there are many fewer small, very small HHH projects, likely related to the selection criteria and the financial incentives I mentioned earlier. When you look at this sort of 35 to 49 unit grouping, you can see that these are basically identical. And then furthermore, when you go way out here to much larger projects, which are all uh, type one construction. So in other words, they're basically all high rises, like steel and cement projects. You can see here too, that there's not a significant difference in the shares of these projects. And this is likely due to the fact that when you get to sort of high rise construction, the, comp the union composition of workforces becomes very high anyway. So the idea here is that these projects aren't, aren't likely particularly constrained by the PLA. In other words, the PLA probably didn't change as much about them. However, when you look at this middle group of projects around the PLA threshold, you see this notable difference. Around 45% of HHH funded projects are, um, oh yeah, I think you that Git repo that someone just posted up there and the link to the report are both correct. Sorry to digress. Um, you see about 45% of projects here funded by HHH are in this 50 to 64 unit range while less fewer than 10% of the non-HHH projects are. And then you can see that the HHH funded projects in these uh, large bins to the right of the threshold are quite small, uh, you know, between sort of half to about 30% of the size of the projects in the non-HHH pipeline. And you can see here, if you look at the non-HHH pipeline, there's sort of this increasing frequency of projects of larger sizes. And this, you know, is what you might expect under the notion that there are economies of scale to building larger projects, but HHH funded projects seem to run in completely the opposite direction in terms of a pattern. Um, so that's going to lead me to talk a little bit of, more about economies of scale as a way to move to talking about the cost effects. Um, and I'm going to return to these, uh, this sort of size differences after I discuss the next component here. So um, estimating the cost effects of the PLA, this, this is the most directly comparable um, aspect of this project with the existing research because the, the unique aspect of the threshold makes the, the information I just showed you not really, uh, there's no real good analog to it in the existing research. However, many projects have attempted to estimate cost effects. Um, as I mentioned, this, so this is a disputed literature. However, um, you know, just anecdotally, in terms of internal HHH documents that were used, uh, that, that are passed around in the city, discussing things like cost increases in projects, citing the PLA as a cost driver was, was pretty trivial. It was cited at least on at least two occasions I found as a, um, among a few justifications for significant cost increases to projects. Um, but uh, so to get into how I'm gonna try to model costs, um, which, is a, which is unique compared to how it's been done in the past, um, it's gonna be necessary to just talk a bit more about the notion of economies of scale. So um, if the, I apologize if this is overly pedantic, but um, economies of scale relates to the notion that a project has many fixed or semi-fixed costs that don't linearly increase with project size. So this could be things like site prep, foundation work, the, the sort of required size of a basic workforce versus a workforce building a slightly larger building, et cetera. And, and the upshot of all this is that as the number of units increase, the per unit costs of the development may often decrease. And I'll show you first some descriptive evidence on this, and then I'll show you um, some graphical evidence that I hopefully will sort of help cement the intuition of the regression model I'm gonna use. So first descriptively, I'll show you some uh, comparisons here of per unit costs according to size and funding source. And so this is sort of uh, similar to the figure I showed a moment ago where I'm grouping projects in 15 unit groups here across the PLA threshold, or actually, no, sorry, not 15 unit groups. This is a larger bin, but basically just cutting at the PLA threshold and then just grouping projects in these fairly arbitrary groupings. Uh, and the, I have some code in the replication that shows that this isn't a particularly uh, unusual outcome with respect to some other possible groupings. But, uh, but the point to make here is that 
this basically starts 49 or fewer units, 50 to 64, 65 to 94, and 95 plus units. And if you look at these light gray bars, and this is total unit cost in thousands of dollars on the y-axis. So if you look at these light gray bars, which are the non-HHH projects, um, what you see is a really nice illustration of the concept of economies of scale, right? These, these projects uh, the, in the smallest group by size, the average unit costs about $500,000 per unit. If you follow across to the right, you'll see that these costs decrease in quite a linear fashion until you get to $400,000 per unit by the time you're talking about 95 units or higher. So these are basically like high rise buildings. Now, when you look at the HHH funded projects, you see sort of a analogous decline, but then you see this really large jump up when you cross the PLA threshold here. Uh, and, and it's this, this idea of a discontinuity across the PLA threshold is the, the kind of thing I'm gonna to leverage to try to estimate the cost effect of the PLA. Um, but before I move on, one important thing to note here is that HHH funded projects are everywhere more expensive. Um, you can see there's basically this kind of like constant level difference in, in costs. And this is important to note because this is to say that the, the evidence I'm gonna show you here is not sufficient to explain all the cost differences in HHH. It's sufficient to explain a portion of those cost differences. Uh, these other potential cost drivers that seem to exist is something that I'm interested in trying to pursue in future research. But um, I think that's just an important thing to note. So now I'm gonna basically try to take this same idea and I'm gonna show you a little bit more of a sort of a regression based uh, data concept here, right? So this is a scatter plot now where construction cost per unit in thousands of dollars is on the y-axis and then the number of units is on the x-axis. Um, so and the, the idea I'm gonna try to give you here is um, the approach that's sort of driving the regression model I'm gonna use. Now you can fit a regression line through these data points to estimate the sort of overall economies of scale rel uh, that, that occurs from larger project sizes, right? And this is what this slightly downward dashed line is doing, right? This basically fits the best line through all these data points that minimizes the squared distance between each data point in the line. And this shows that there's sort of a gentle downward relationship in terms of uh, how costs decline as the size, size of projects increase. But what's important to note is that when you, when you specify that you can only fit one line through these data, then that doesn't allow there to be any real issue happening at the PLA threshold. And if you'll notice here, as I mentioned earlier, there's this apparent really large bunching here right at this threshold. And it kind of looks even to look at that there's this line, and then maybe here there's some other kind of line, right? So if I instead allow there to be two different regression lines based on whether you're on one side or another of this PLA threshold, you get actually quite a different slope and a much more significant uh, economies of scale here. And basically the idea behind the regression model I'm going to estimate here is to estimate the size of this discontinuity for HHH funded projects, then also allow there to be a similar discontinuity among non-HHH funded projects. And the estimate I'm gonna take is the effect of the PLA on cost is gonna be the difference in these two discontinuities. And so to answer the earlier question in the chat, you know, if there are other factors that drive a discontinuity here besides HHH, then that discontinuity should be present in other projects that are similar in every significant way I'm aware of, except for using HHH funding. And that's the basic idea behind the cost model I'm gonna estimate. Um, of course, this is just a descriptive exercise here, you know, without any contr controlling for any other characteristics or projects. So in the model I'm gonna estimate, uh, I control for a variety of important aspects of projects that may also drive differences in hard costs or construction costs. Um, these include the number of stories. And then uh, importantly, I also group projects according to ranges of stories in a way that is correlated with known cost drivers, for instance, moving from podium to type one construction, uh, being a project being five or more stories triggers commercial prevailing wage, even among projects that aren't subject to the PLA. Uh, and things of this nature. Um, I also control for the shares of units according to size. So in other words, studio, one bedroom, two bedroom, three plus bedrooms, the shares of units that are supportive housing versus affordable housing, 
the presence of elevators or significant parking structures, which is something that LIHTC uh, allows to affect the cost basis of projects in terms of their potential allocation of LIHTC. And then indicators for the target populations of each of these projects, which may affect certain aspects of the building in terms of common areas and other factors. So after controlling for all these uh, potentially important cost drivers, I then estimate this remaining discontinuity and construction cost at 65 units, as I mentioned, that compares the discontinuity among HHH funded and non-HHH funded projects. The difference in these two discontinuities is what I'm gonna present uh, as the results here. Um, and what I find is when I first, when I use construction cost in dollars as the outcome of interest, which is what I end up focusing on. I estimate that the PLA increased costs on covered projects by between $43,000 and $47,000 per unit or around 14 to 16%. Um, I, uh, these, I, I estimate a number of models that cut data, for instance, cutting outlier data that are much smaller and much larger projects so that these outlier projects maybe aren't driving this discontinuity as much. I uh, estimate a model that cuts out projects right at the threshold and just on, on either side of it so that if there's sort of sorting here that might affect the estimate, then that would be taken into account. And I don't find much variation. I find this about, about a 8% you know, variation across these different sort of ways of specifying the model. Um, and let's see, to, to Richard's point, um, these are all quite... Uh, this is all the, these are all the results here and I plot these, the, I put the p-values on here. So all the results I come up with, no matter how I do this, are all quite uh, precisely estimated. And also notice for the, I also want to flag for the sort of regression literate, um, that these models have really quite high adjusted R squared. So they, they do a really good job of explaining a significant component of the total variation in construction costs. Um, Another commonly used outcome measure in past research that I also estimate uh, is to take the dependent variable construction costs and take the natural log of these costs. And um, this is commonly done because it allows uh, estimates to be interpreted in, a, in approximately a percent difference uh, manner. And when I do that, and this is how much of the past research on PLAs was done using this outcome variable. So when I do this, I, I estimate a generally larger effect of the PLA of around 20% or closer to $60,000 per unit. This is, um, this is sort of uh, comparable to what um, was found in a couple of sort of government sponsored, uh, more, more descriptive approaches that I mentioned earlier. Yeah, and as I mentioned here, the model, the model has really high explanatory power and, and the estimates uh, change very little across a number of variations, including those I just mentioned around data cuts, but also around using flexible approaches to estimating the slopes, allowing curvature and things like this. And I have a sort of a pretty thick uh, appendix section considering a lot of these different factors and none of them really have any qualitatively meaningful effect on the, uh, on the estimates. Uh, so um, what I'm gonna do with those two pieces of evidence is try to bring them together to really more effectively address the key policy question here, which is how did PLA affect the unit goal of HHH, since that was how the city council sort of phrased their, uh, you know, their motivation. Hey, Jason, there's a couple of questions that we could address now and then get sure. to the part of, of your talk. So first was when uh, Richard asked if there's any control for location, um, so it's some sort of fixed effects or any other approach there. Um, I didn't, oh yeah, so first off, I also want to mention for, for those who are in the weeds a little bit more, um, the way I controlled for time, I control for time non-parametrically by using just your fixed effects. Um, I did not control for location. Um, however, I show some evidence in the, in the report that the, the spatial distribution of projects is such that the HHH and non-HH projects don't appear to have any different sort of uh, distribution in terms of where they are in the city or anything like that. They all are pretty widely distributed across the city. Um, there was a question from Eric Heikala about labor market impacts that might not be out of the scope of this paper, but certainly if, uh, if the wages are higher, um, one would expect some impacts there as well. Uh, yeah, I wonder if Eric wants to, I'm not exactly sure. Um, what, what the idea is there. I mean, and in some sense, so I guess I'm not, I'll just say what's on my mind, I guess, when I read that is that, you know, the PLA essentially restricts the, the labor pool that can work on certain of these projects. 
And that anecdotally has been raised to me by a number of developers as a major concern because their perception uh, has been pretty uniformly that, that union labor is quite well utilized in the city these days. So that um, one, of their, one of the concerns I've heard expressed on multiple occasions is that, you know, we may have a project with the PLA and we, we depend on labor being sent by the union halls, but if, you know, they have a better project, like a larger project that's gonna last longer, et cetera, there's a lot of concern about whether they're gonna get the allocation of labor on the, on the timeline that they mentioned. So I'm not sure if that's what you mean, but I'd be happy to chat about that uh, in the discussion later. Um, Sounds good. Yeah, so um, so now I'm going to try to give you a sense of what I've done here. Um, what I essentially thought about is like, how can I sort of bring these factors together, this evidence on developer behavior and then this evidence on cost. And what I came up with was an idea of doing a simulation that um, basically does two things. First, it uses the regression model to estimate a per project construction cost with the effect of the PLA that I estimate essentially turned off. So for those of you familiar with regression analysis, you can essentially, you know, when something's an indicator variable, especially you can just sort of set it to zero and then predict the outcome, the cost outcome without that factor. And so what I do is that, and then I take that predicted construction cost and add it back to the actual other costs of a project, which may, which may vary like land costs and soft costs and then come up with a counterfactual sample of, you know, this is, these are the predictions of what the cost per project would have been without the PLA. And then what I do is I use this sort of uh, source sample and take an alternate distribution of project size as another, as a second counterfactual component. And to try to give you a quick intuition, what I do is I don't have anything change with these sort of larger and smaller regions of project size distribution. But for this area I highlighted earlier, I do two things. I do two approaches and then I take the average of them. First, I, I take these HHH shares that are sort of lopsidedly smaller and I distribute them uh, uniformly across here. And then the second thing I do is I take them and I distribute them according to the relative size of the these proportions in the non-HHH sample. And essentially I just end up taking the average of these two approaches, um, though they, they don't disagree in a really qualitatively meaningful way. Um, oops, I went back to the wrong slide. Okay, so basically what I do is I, I assign these shares of what the project's uh, distribution would have looked like in the absence of the PLA. And then I take that data set with predict alternate predicted costs and I randomly draw the number of projects for each of those shares until I've developed a sample, like a sort of, a, it's basically a bootstrap approach for those um, for whom that means something. Develop this sort of alternate sample of randomly drawing projects according to these counterfactual shares. And then I calculate the total number of housing units in that sample, the average per unit cost, and then the total cost savings uh, that represents. And then I do this a thousand times and I take the mean value of all these outcomes as, as the, uh, the simulation result. So to give you the results, um, what, what that exercise indicates is that first off, um, absent the PLA, I estimate that around 700 more units of housing would have been produced almost 10% more than the approximately 7,300 in the pipeline today. Simply if developers had proposed a slate of projects that were distributed similarly to projects in the non-HHH funded pipeline. Then the second thing I do is the sa there are savings associated with this, right? So that the cost savings from projects not being covered by the PLA is summed up. And these savings uh, would have been about $68 million um, lower than the estimated cost of building the actually 7,300 7, units in the pipeline to build this more like 8,000 units. So then I can take this $68 million and using this counterfactual per unit cost, I convert this money into additional housing units and find that it yields around 120 more housing units. And then I put this together and think of this as the, uh, an estimate of the foregone, the, 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 the foregone housing in, associated with the, the use of the PLA. And, and together, these two factors add up to a bit more than 800 housing units in total. Yeah, so that's basically how I try to take a stab at getting at uh, what might have happened in a world without the PLA. Um, you know, and, and the takeaway is broadly just that it seems to have influenced the unit goal of the the proposition quite a bit.
that, that 8,000 or 800 additional units represents around 12% or 13% more units than we're actually, they're actually in the pipeline today. Um, the last thing I'm going to touch on, as I mentioned, is not really, um, you know, empirical research per se, but um, just to consider this notion of the targeted hiring component of the PLA. Um, and really all I'm able to do is consider what is the nature of the existing evidence based on how PLAs do in facilitating local and disadvantaged hiring. Um, and what I, what I found in doing this is that the evidence on how PLAs do in meeting these goals is sparse. Um, there, I, I was aware of about three studies, uh, some of which were brought to my attention, um, some of which I had found myself. Uh, these cover in total around nine PLAs and four non-PLA targeted hiring programs that had outcomes that were sufficiently comparable and complete to sort of make any comparison. Using these 13 programs, uh, outcomes, I found that around 33% of documented targeted hiring goals were met under PLAs, while around 50% were met under non-PLA targeted hiring programs. I wouldn't put much stock in this difference, except to say that maybe it's suggestive that PLAs don't do as well as non-targeted, uh, you know, as a, rather as non-PLA targeted hiring, which maybe makes sense if we, we were just touching on that there may be a, a larger labor pool that you could bring to bear to meet targeted hiring goals if it wasn't uh, requiring the hiring of primarily union apprentices. Um, importantly, I'm unaware of any evidence that credibly compares the levels of targeted hiring under PLAs with the status quo. So that is to say, there's really, uh, you know, there's really no evidence on like how diverse is the workforce in terms of these types of goals without a PLA and without a targeted hiring program. And I think this is really the important baseline that needs to be uh, you know, referenced for any sort of analysis of how well a PLA does at improving hiring outcomes and career pipelines. Um, so that's basically what I have to present to you. Um, just to sort of wrap up the conclusions, the developers appear to have responded strongly to the presence of the PLA by building smaller projects. The PLA added an estimated $43,000 in construction costs to covered projects, though alternate estimates that are comparable with some past literature suggest that this may have been up to 50% larger, more around $60,000. Uh, the simulation I described suggests that the PLA reduced the total housing output of HHH by around 800 units. Targeted hiring goals and PLAs appear to perhaps perform moderately worse than standalone targeted hiring programs. And I really try to shy away from making any significant policy recommendations because I think you know the, the, the framework from which you might make recommendations is important. But I think there's one thing that's pretty clear based on the kind of criticism that has arisen in the last few years. And that's that you know to maintain both voter and policymaker support for programs aimed at addressing our regional housing needs. So labor regulations and PLAs should generally be attached to proposed housing policies up front as they were in, for instance, Measure JJJ, which was on the ballot at the same time as HHH. And that the trade-offs from these kinds of, you know, ma this marriage of policies should be debated transparently rather than having them added after the fact. Um, I think there's a few really uh, important research questions that could drive some future research in this area. Uh, one of which I'm already trying to sort of begin to make some headway on, and that's to, to try to get in the weeds with developers and find out what motivated them to avoid the PLA. And in my, you know, in my mind, the sort of basic framework is whether they accurately understood the costs and benefits or whether they just simply didn't know them and were concerned about uncertainty because there's a lot of uncertainty already in developing these kind of projects, or maybe whether there are other factors that I'm you know, not aware of at this time. The second thing that I'm quite curious about is whether or not a higher unit threshold for instance, uh, the, the sort of developer side of negotiations to form the PLA uh, suggested a 75 unit threshold, and that was not uh, what ultimately obtained in the negotiations. What, whether a higher threshold might have achieved actually more union labor utilization by leading to larger projects that would more, be more likely to hear, I sort of air quote, naturally employ union subs through differences in construction type, for instance. And then the third question, I think, is whether the, you know, is to try to make some progress on this targeted hiring question. First, whether the use of existing approaches to targeted hiring, such as the city's own existing ordinance or an enforceable ordinance related to publicly funded developments in Pasadena, 
as two sort of salient examples, have met the the city council's professed hiring goals without affecting the unit goal. And then I think, you know, as I alluded to, even more importantly, like how significant is this problem? Like how hard is it for diverse uh, worker groups to enter these careers in the first place? There's really very little evidence on that. And that's what I've got for you. So it looks like we still have around 15 minutes or so, and I'd be happy to take your questions or discuss or listen to you all discuss. Thank you so much, Jason. Um, first, Charlie, you you uh, put a question in the chat about the simulation experiment that that Jason did. So I thought I would ask um, you to, if you're interested in coming off mute, you can go ahead and, and ask the question directly. All right. Well, perfect. Well, thank you, uh, Jason, for that um, great study. That's that's super interesting. Um, I just wanted to ask, like, I guess, like, it seems like there would also be sort of an interesting analysis done on the foregone units from what the highest and best use of those sites could be based on sort of like if a project is, you know, a um, 10,000 square foot site, it could, be it could be entitled by right based on certain density bonuses for 75 units. And the developer sort of artificially suppressed what they requested for entitlements from the city because of the PLA. That would lead to say 11 or, you know, sort of in this example, 75 was, the, was what it could have been by right entitled for, but they only asked for 64. It'd be sort of this 11 units of like foregone density mm -hmm. that we could have been building. Mm -hmm. So. I guess, I mean, there's two ways to kind of look at it, both from like, you know, the, co the cost standpoint and what we gave up based on just overspending per unit and then sort of like the, the lost uh, entitled uh, density that we could have gotten out of every, all, every one of these sites. Right, so that, that's a great, interesting thought experiment. I, 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 did, I don't have any evidence on that. Um, you know, I will say that that's probably also an open question even for, um, you know, on a couple of, so I think, for, well, there, so there's a, a couple of things that probably bear on that, right? First off there, I think there are like hard constraints on the maximum light tech funding you could get. And that may have affected, you know, what you could actually do. And I think developers ability to put together a sufficient capital stack is at least anecdotally, probably a pretty important driver for how much they sort of fully utilize land vis-a-vis -vis the potential entitlements. Um, but, you know, I think even looking at, projects covered by the PLA, it, I would I would expect that there are probably gaps there in what was built versus what could have potentially been entitled because, you know, again, and, and that would maybe be some evidence uh, indirectly, at least on the extent to which funding constraints um, or the ability to raise the needed capital may have played a role. But that would be a great thing to uh, look into further. So I thank you for that. So I see a response here. Yeah, yeah. I think this would be a challenging thing to measure, but uh, it would definitely be interesting to dig into. And, and one of the things, as I mentioned earlier, we're trying to do now at the center is try to establish a more robust pipeline of uh, dialogue with developers. Um, and we're, we're kind of looking into the feasibility of implementing a survey that, you know, will maybe uh, be in a structure that will allow sufficient candor, but also protect uh, individual developers who may be concerned about speaking about some of these issues um, in, in certain ways. So yeah, if anyone else just wants to pop in, you can feel free to speak off chat or whatever else. Jason, in some ways it's remarkable that the you know more sophisticated analysis that you did came incredibly close to what GAO did. Um, you know, it, it could be just because that is, uh, in fact, the, the right set of numbers, but but typically when we bring better models to bear, um, results differ for one reason or another. Any sense there? Well, I was struck by that too. And I mean, I was, you know, to a certain extent, I was struck by the fact that these estimates aren't that different than some of the models that I think have, you know, are subject to rightful critiques about the issues I related earlier with like geographic mm -hmm. confounding and stuff. So, um, you know, it's hard to say. I mean, obviously, like I, I would only ever propose that this is like sort of an internally valid result based on this time and place in Los Angeles, potentially even this type of housing. Sure. But, you know, so it's hard to say whether that's like ultimately some sort of right number. I kind of would suspect not because, you know, a lot of things change over time. And like, for instance, there's a, you know, there may be a study mm -hmm. from 25 years ago that said 20% or whatever. So right. I tend to think that's more uh, of a happenstance Fact. Well, the other interesting thing is I can think of two for-profit developers who do affordable housing. Mm 
who and I have asked them, what do PLAs add to your costs? They both said 15 to 20%. <laughs> and neither of them are kind of, and this was in private, and neither of them are particularly, oh. you know, they're developers that you don't believe anything they say. These two mm -hmm. guys are not in that category. Mm -hmm. So there's another very unrobust data point that aligns with your finding. Yeah, that's good to hear, you know, I mean, and I had heard developers sort of spitball about that, too. So I thought, well, you know, and I will note that, for instance, like, yeah, so, uh, you know, I think sort of in, a, in some sense, as an economist, we're like, we're always concerned with like, bias more like, you know, we'd always generally prefer to have like, downward bias estimates than upward bias estimates. So, and that's one of the reasons I sort of chose to focus on the dollar denominated outcomes, because a, I don't have a strong reason to think that you need to log costs or something like exponential, you know, issues with the distribution of costs or something like that. And B, I just thought, you know, if there are errors, this is obviously like a pretty sensitive topic. So I'd rather put forth a solid estimate that might be a bit too small or something. And I think in that sense, like the sort of 15 to 20 percent range is also sort of brackets what you just mentioned there. But I, I put in the chat, it's not small at all because when you look at developer pro formas, the gross margin that they need in order to get their return hurdle is 15%. Now, a 15% right. gross margin. Now, if, if these are nonprofits, then this doesn't become an issue from that dimension. But if you're a for-profit and basically, yeah. you know, your limited partners are requiring an 8% return hurdle before you even get paid as the general partner, you need that margin. So if 15% eats up your whole margin, you're not going to do it. Yeah, and Richard, was that was that estimate that those guys were quoting to you? Was that on total costs, or was that just construction costs? Because my my stuff is important to re realize just construction costs, and I think that translates to you know more like five percent in total costs or something. Yeah, I think uh, that's a good question, and I I think it is just construction costs. Yeah, okay. Because no, right. no, no, no. most of the existing lid is construction costs too, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I think, too, it's important to note that, like, for affordable housing developers, they still do have these hard constraints. You know, it may not be with, like, uh, sort of demands of investors, but it might be with just, like, making this thing pencil in terms of, like, uh, you know, a lot, of, especially for supportive housing, a lot of these uh, people that create these projects, especially if they do, but if they both provide services and develop projects, they have to be concerned about the sort of lifetime uh, feasibility of the project <laughs> would be the cost of funding the services. And there's a lot of uncertainty in the long-term funding pipeline for service provision. So in some cases, these developers capitalize, like say the first decade of service provision into their upfront capital stack that they build. So some of these, you know, differences, even if they are, say, like less than 5% in total per unit cost may just make a project be infeasible, even without a sort of a profit motive or developer, you know, or, or investors that demand a really specific return or something. Jason, really quick, I just wanted to thank you for sharing your research. Um, I had two questions or comments. Uh, one was related to if you had looked at anything related to um, the capital stack of different projects and this kind of relationship that you had, um, meaning, you know, it, I worked on a LIHTC application this summer in Chicago, and we oftentimes dealt with that 60-ish unit threshold as a reasonable threshold for a lot of LIHTC project funding anyway. Um, but I wasn't sure, like in states where there's more funding available, like California, where you can build a pretty deep capital stack if you're patient and <laughs> do lots of applications, if that would affect the unit count that a developer would be willing to build and how that might play into this whole thing as well. Um, and the other question or kind of comment was related to your work on um, uh, targeted hiring um, and just kind of just on the anecdotal side of like kind of how the MBE WB BIPOC requirements are often undermined or in conflict with union labor requirements due to union labor hiring practices. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, so I think that, you know, I, I don't, so the, to, to your first point, um, I think the capital stack question is a really important one. And like, for instance, um, there's been some movement in, in addressing some of the potential issues related to that kind of stuff. Uh, I, and if I'm, if I'm remembering this right, I just read the other day that there's a bill or just maybe it's a regulatory change or something at the state level at HCD to allow the stacking of multiple uh, state funded programs which was previously prohibited. So, you know, first off, it's worth noting that H, you know, and this is this is worth noting broadly. Let me zoom out for one moment. HHH seems to have incentivized the development of a lot of housing that we really need. So that's great. You know, um, the question is just, you know, 
is there a better way to do this in the future? Because there was a lot of, you know, issues around the costs and the timeline and all this stuff, right? Capital stack development seems to be still a huge thing. I think HHH incentivized uh, better outcomes along those lines because it provided this upfront funding commitment that you could take to other people that provide soft loans and say, look, I got 25% going here. You know, it's going to be easier to get the next 20% or whatever. So that's an important uh, positive. And I think that the reforms that are going forward now may make that even easier in the future. And all those things add up to a lot of time, which can add up to costs. But, um, you know, I, I don't know that there's anything about capital stack issues that would have, you know, driven that kind of sharp decline. And that I, the only thing I can really make sense of that is thinking of it as the effect of the PLA threshold. Um, you know, to your second point, um, that's a kind of a crazy world unto itself. Um, one of the one of the people I spoke with for this report was a, an attorney who works on behalf of municipalities and other funding entities to negotiate the types of uh, targeted hiring provisions in PLAs. And I think you're correct that that's you know in, in general, you know the, the incentives are such that in an ideal world unions wouldn't have to worry about this stuff, even if they worry about it. They don't necessarily want to have a lot of hard goals, right? They want to just sort of, I think unions are making sort of valid internal efforts to diversify their membership and stuff, and that's to be commended. But like, you know, that's not necessarily like a first order concern in these PLAs. I think for cities that have to sort of sell these PLAs that may, you know, may, may include higher costs, longer timelines, things like that. I think they're very concerned about that. So I think that is a sort of a, a point of contention that you know is obviously the subject of pretty active negotiation as these kinds of agreements are hammered out. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the comment. And we are happy to share the paper if you didn't catch the link at the very beginning or in the invitation. Um, Jason, really appreciate your willingness to share it. It's in one of these kinds of questions that appears, in fact, something that was intended, which was to increase wages actually increases the cost. Um, but you know, the, the precision of, of your approach, I, I really, I really valued myself and, and I think this will be really important for the literature going forward and also, you know, speaks directly to the questions that I know a lot of people are wrestling with here in the city and County of Los Angeles. Yeah. So. And I, you know, I do hope that like, since there's, there seems to be a pretty big funnel of money coming down the pipeline right now. So I hope that maybe, you know, this will just help us move forward in terms of just making more transparent, uh, use of this, these kinds of resources they can sort of maintain a broad uh, level of support. And thanks for letting me present. And if anyone wants to reach out to me, you can find my email address pretty easily here around, and I'm happy to discuss this stuff further. Great, thanks so much, Jason. Thanks, bye everybody. Thanks for everybody for joining us today.